Later that evening, after the kids had gone to sleep, I uh, sat with my wife in our living room and uh, shared with her what I noticed on my drive home. I told her I felt a kind of pretty strong urge to share what I'd learned about how to you know, care for myself, take care of my whole self, mind, body, the whole thing. Um, the deadline to submit talks was still about three or four hours away, so she encouraged me. Um, it took a bit of encouraging, but she did it. Uh, to submit another topic. So I figured, you yeah, know, why not? Then we'll pick a talk called Take Care of Yourself. We've already submitted two perfectly good technical topics. Should be fine. I uh, guess I was wrong. So uh, I added the talk to my submission and got ready for bed. And um, maybe about an hour later, I was you know, turning off all the lights, locking the doors, all the stuff you usually do before you go to bed. And I got a call from my mom, and she said, yeah, Nathan, Dad, stop breathing. And uh, that was kind of the end of the day. It kind of capped off, I guess, probably the most difficult day I've ever had. But um, I was ready for it. I was ready for it because over the kind of preceding two and a half years, I'd learned how to take care of myself, how to love myself, how to be present with my thoughts and feelings in the moment. And when the, that awful moment came, I was able to be with it and not be owned by it. I still felt all the pain, felt all the grief and the sadness in technicolor, really. Um, but, but I didn't suffer. But that, and that was no lucky accident. It was a result of consistent and deliberate daily practice. And that's the thing that I wanted to share now that you know how this talk came, came to be. Um, so I'm <clears throat> going to start with uh, the first thing most people think of when, uh, when they think of health or wellness or taking care of themselves, which is your physical body. It's where I started and where I put my focus for quite a few years. So we kind of have two variables to work with diet and exercise. So I'm going to start with exercise. Um, you've probably heard by now that it's important. Um, I think we've all heard that at this point. Uh, decades of research have been built up now that uh, show the, the, ben the benefit of just 30 minutes of moderate to intense physical exercise is uh, uh, there are, I'm sorry, there are tons of benefits for just mod 30 minutes of moderate to intense physical exercise. Basically, whatever gets your breathing labored for a sustained period is fine. It really doesn't matter. Um, and you know, that's what the green activity ring on your Apple Watch is for. And that's why it you know, fills in even if you're not like, doing a workout. Because as long as it's good uh, moderate exercise, it's enough. So just fill that thing in every day and you'll be fine. Um, but there are lots of things you can do. You can go on a hike, you can go on a bike ride, a jog, do some yoga, or even a simple uh, fast-paced walk is good enough. I do that a lot, actually. Um, but uh, I mentioned research earlier. There are you know, a lot of different things that, have been, uh, that are impacted by regular daily uh, 30 minutes of physical exercise, and that's... Uh, so far, the list is uh, the, you lower your risk for heart disease, Alzheimer's, many different mental illnesses, and many types of cancer. Um, it's really good for depression uh, and uh, lots of other little um, kind of mental issues. <clears throat> so it's very important and very simple. And if you have an Apple Watch, which I see a bunch of you do, then it's pretty easy to make sure that you do it. Uh, Personally, I'm a big fan of yoga. Uh, I usually start my day with 30 minutes of yoga, so I get my ring taken care of. Um, I use an app called uh, Down Dog, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's actually really good. And as soon as I wake up, I kind of amble on over to my yoga mat and just get to work. And I get, and I get my 30 minutes in before everyone else in the house is awake, and I feel great. I feel great all morning and for you know, really the first half of the day. I don't even drink coffee in the morning anymore. It's the exercise is my coffee. I realized one day that 
I kind of felt like I'd had coffee and I really hadn't. It just, oh, I just did yoga for half an hour and took a shower and that's all I really needed. And I was good till lunch. Um, but I also try to get outside at least a couple days a week. There's lots of other, there are lots of benefits to being out in green spaces. Uh, physical, but mostly, but also very mental. Uh, you know, sometimes for me, it's I, I go mountain biking or just take a walk down my neighborhood Greenbelt, so I get kind of the best of both. Uh, I really love being around lots of trees, so I try to get out there regularly. It's uh, uh, it helps me just calm down, <clears throat> even if I don't realize that I need a little calming down. So uh, something I highly recommend is trying to get outside, not just doing your exercise inside, don't get on the treadmill all the time, or the uh, you know, stationary bike, that stuff's great. I do all that too. But um, at least a couple days a week uh, can really change your mood. Even if it's just a little bit, little changes, if you have a lot of little changes, they do compound, um, which is kind of the story, kind of what has happened to me over the past seven or eight years. But there is one thing that the vast majority of the research shows is not really um, impacted at all, maybe just a little bit, by exercise. And uh, that's weight loss. So exercise has a ton of beneficial impacts, kind of as I was going over, and I take advantage of those as much as I can. Um, but weight loss is all about what you put in, not what you take out, what you put in your body. It's all about your diet and uh, all about what and how much you eat. And uh, you might be wondering how I know this. So that was me at WWDC in 2010 with a dude picking his nose behind me. <laughs> so, good stuff. I hope that's not someone who's here. Uh, I don't know. But uh, if you are, you're not famous, I guess. Um, that is, so that was 2010, and I really got very serious about this stuff kind of in late 2011. So about eight years later, I looked like that. And uh, it was the vast majority of that came from a change in what I was putting into my body, a change in my diet. Uh, in fact, the first probably 40 pounds I dropped, I, did, I changed nothing but my diet. I didn't change any of my physical activity at all. Um, so I really like this quote. It comes from a book uh, Michael Pollan, who's a New York Times food writer, wrote uh, called In Defense of Food. He said, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, there's kind of, it's in the book, and so he kind of breaks the sentence down. The, phrase down a little more what he actually means by food is you know real food whole food not processed food um, you know things that uh, grow or natural or uh, things that aren't uh, broken down pieces of other food all mixed together um, then the not too much should be pretty obvious you don't need as much as you think you do or as much as you've conditioned yourself to think you do and then mostly plants should also be pretty obvious. Um, but I really like this quote, but uh, if you really wanted to apply it to me, to, you have to switch mostly with only. And uh, that's what I started doing back in 2011. And uh, it's not really a coincidence, it's the year my first son was born, uh, in that August, and um, you saw what I looked like, and I, uh, heard about the whole food plant-based diet. I uh, watched a documentary and I got a book. Uh, the documentary was uh, uh, Forks Over Knives. And I got a book and said, why not? It was, I had like this one month plan. I figured I could do anything for a month. So I gave it a shot. And I wanted to make sure, you know, because I'm an engineer, I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, I was getting benefit. The, that I could actually measure the benefits I was getting. So uh, I only changed that one variable. And I also, before I started, 
went and got a bunch of blood work done, all vitals, and you know all that stuff. Um, I was already on uh, cholesterol medication, and my blood pressure was starting to get dangerously high, to the point, high enough to the point where I might have to start taking medication with that too. So I had all my levels done, and then um, started the one month uh, kind of challenge, I guess you call it, and. I ate nothing but whole food, plant-based food for a whole month, and it actually kind of, it took uh, an extra week for me to get actually in to get my blood work done, so it was really five weeks. Um, but I went back five weeks later, and I, I'd already known that there was a big change because uh, I've been weighing myself, and you know, I'd already, I was, I'd already dropped about 30 pounds, it was actually 28 pounds, in those five weeks. And uh, when I went and got my blood work done, my, uh, all my numbers dropped way down, as well as my vitals and all that. But uh, you know, specifically, the one that I was on the medication for, the cholesterol, it was on the medication, as I was taking it when I got the first test done, it was the, my total cholesterol was like 172. And um, five weeks later, it was 72. And uh, it was too low. So I had to stop taking the medication. I've never taken it again, um, and uh, it is. I've maintained it below the total below 120 ever since. Um, it's you know it goes up and down occasionally, but um, it's been in a, it's been in a healthy range ever since. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but one, or, or, you know I. I uh, one reason I liked the diet, or the this way of eating, is uh, is really just a simple math problem. Uh, if you think about volume and density of the food, I think the reason it was so easy to drop weight, I didn't have to think much, right? There's just a list of stuff I can eat, and as long as I eat those things, that's all I had to do. Uh, if you think about you know plant foods, and you think about um, you know anything, especially if it's even even if it's if it's cooked or raw, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're very low in uh, like density per vo like the the calories per volume, right? The density is uh, really low compared to say like you know a tablespoon of um, of oil because <clears throat> oil is not a whole food, so I didn't eat oil. I didn't cook with oil or anything. Um, you know, a tablespoon of oil is, uh, has a ton of calories in it, in it enough to uh, cover an entire meal, really. And, uh, you know, but if you think about how much, say, you know, lettuce or vegetables or something you have to eat to get, uh, to get up to even, like, what you get in, say, a, a half of a hamburger, you can't do it. You just physically can't put that much food into your stomach. So the rule was, as long as we eat these things, it doesn't matter how much you eat, when you eat, whatever, just do it. And that's what I did for years, and it worked. I mean, I'm uh, gone back up a little bit lately, but uh, I'm, you know, 100 pounds lighter now than I was then, um, and more than 100 lighter than I was before that. Uh, so, kind of took advantage of the volume and the density of the food, and, you know, took advantage of the other properties of just eating whole foods. Uh, now the thing about this is, I don't want to come up here and say that this is the right thing for you to do though. I mean, nutrition science is still a really kind of, oh, I forgot, I wanted to show you some vegetables, there we go, and fruit. Um, yeah, nutrition science is really a kind of nascent field. It's, the evidence for anything is really shaky. Um, it's partially because it's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty new field. It's the age of uh, the actual the amount of research that's been done just doesn't come close to most other scientific endeavors. Um, but also, the kind of biological diversity across the humans is is extremely wide, and uh, it's kind of nearly impossible to account for it. in, you know, when you're researching general populations and large aggregates. So everything gets boiled down, you know, to averages. Well, most people are an outlier somewhere in all those averages. And so uh, not only are most of the, uh, is it most of the nutrition research kind of 
um, inconclusive, there's a good chance it doesn't apply to you anyway. So um, you can get some kind of some broad direction from you know promising research, which is how I ended up on the plant-based, the whole food plant-based diet. Uh, you know, it was the research was convincing enough for me to at least give it a shot, and then see if it works, and see if it works for you. You know, test, uh, do uh, experiments. Uh, you know, work with your doctor on it, and they, you, you can find something else. It's a little different for everybody. Um, but also, before I kind of move on from dieting, I want to make sure I emphasize that I'm talking about diet and or not diet and not dieting. Um, you know, I'm having a quality diet. It's a day in, day out kind of thing. It's you know, you hear the word lifestyle change all the time, but that's really what it is. Um, you know, if you eat well for a few months or six months or whatever and then go back to all your old ways, then it doesn't take long for all the benefits you've accumulated to completely evaporate. So um, it really is a way to live your life, not um, a way to lose weight to you know, look better for a wedding or something like that, which totally you can do, but don't think you're making yourself healthier. Um, there's another thing we do with our bodies that is really important, uh, and really important for both physical and mental health, and uh, something that I'm really bad at, and it's sleeping. It's definitely the thing that I have the most trouble with. Uh, I'm sure some of you have uh, similar uh, experiences as I do. Uh, all of the research on sleep says you need at a minimum of seven, seven to nine hours. Okay, seven is the rock bottom. It's really, um, it's really not good, but it's acceptable if it's all you can really get. Uh, there are a few sleep athletes, like sleep uh, magicians, or what do you want to call them? They're huge outliers. Those people do exist, but they're uh, a fraction of 1% of the population. So it is highly likely that you're not one of them, even if you think you are. Um, and the difference between six and seven hours is really, it's quite drastic. It doesn't take long for a, you know, a sleep deficit to accumulate. If you cut back just from seven to six over the course of a week, then it's enough to impair your judgment. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like having two or three beers at the bar. You don't, know, you don't notice it's happening. It's, it's kind of subtle because it happens gradually over that time period. But uh, it does happen. And that's what... There's a lot of, uh, that, that particular uh, bit of research has been replicated a few times now. So um, it's, it's really uh, kind of crazy, I think, that, it, uh, that it, it takes just a little bit, but it really does. Um, now I wish I could tell you that I get eight hours of sleep every night and it makes me an amazing person. Um, it might, but I have no, I have no idea. <laughs> Because uh, I'm lucky to get eight hours of sleep in one night in a week. Um, so it's an area I'm still trying to improve. It's something I uh, am constantly, not constantly, but I'm frequently thinking about. And, um, you know, I have gotten myself up to about six and a half, six to six and a half from the about five and a half I used to get. So that's not bad. Um, so I'm just, again, slowly getting there. It's a game of, it's always a game of inches with this stuff. Um, small improvements accumulate, right? Uh, but there's another side of it, and it's not just about sleep. Something that I've developed a really great appreciation for lately is rest. Um, sleep, obviously, is a form of rest, but uh, I'm talking about awake rest, mental and physical. Um, it's, this is something that is actually a really kind of big deal in the world of elite sports and elite athletes these days. It's something elite athletes are pretty good at and work very hard at. Um, and, you know, I've, uh, I've kept up with some of it because, uh, you know, there are a lot of um, the age of, or the age that elite athletes stop becoming elite athletes, that number has been rising over the past couple decades, especially over the last five to 10 years. Um, you know, there are people like LeBron James and Serena Williams who 
you know, 20 or 30 years ago, at that age, no one was playing at that level uh, consistently. But because they have a, a lot of money and it's all they do, they can experiment with their bodies. And they, uh, and there's, so there's a lot of research on kind of human performance is done on elite athletes because they have the time and money for it. And that is how they make their money, how they make their living. So um, I recently read an interview with Serena Williams' husband, who was one of the founders of Reddit, actually. And um, one of the answers in the interview really stood out to me. He was, he, he was asked what it was like being married to you know, the greatest women's tennis player of all time. And um, the thing that stood out, because I'm really interested in rest, was um, how he marveled at how well she just shuts it all off. That you know, when it's when it's tennis time, it's tennis time. But when it's not, you wouldn't even know she was a tennis player. Like it's completely shut off. There's a, it's like there's a switch, and she is whatever she needs to be at that moment. You know, if she's with the if she's uh, with the kids, she's a mom. Or if she's just sitting in a chair and relaxing, then she's sitting in a chair and relaxing. She's not thinking about tennis. She's not uh, talking about tennis. You. Know, you might, she might you'd be surprised even though she knows what tennis is if you were around her. Um, and he, you know, it was something that he really marveled at, her ability to do that. And that is kind of a, 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 a skill that elite, a lot of elite athletes cultivate. And, uh, you know, trainers to the athletes know it. You know, rest, the whole rest and recovery thing is kind of at the cutting edge right now of athletic performance. And uh, it's not just like sleeping or sitting in a chair or something it's and it's not just physical physical rest is pretty obvious right you don't you need to give your muscles time to, re to recover your body time to recover but the same goes uh mentally as well um there are uh, there's uh trainers that actually recommend to uh athletes when they you know um, i know this happens in the nba a lot uh athletes come off the court at the end of a game, games not only physically exhausting, they're also very mentally taxing. And uh, you know, you're, um, you're basically in a constant state of, you know, uh, of high adrenaline, you know, fight or flight mode all the time. And uh, it's uh, very beneficial to shut that off as quickly as possible, <clears throat> to give yourself time to recover and also do as little damage as possible to your brain or to your kind of ability to get better. Um, so they do all kinds of things. One thing that's really popular is they'll just, like, they go into the locker room after the game and sit down and just start playing video games because it'll shut everything else off. Um, it's a little, uh, it's just another reason to play video games. But uh, you can use that excuse now. It's like, I'm shutting my brain off and I need to. You know, you can watch TV. Some of them watch Netflix or whatever. It's just, a, you know, a show that you like. Anything like that can do it. But there, those aren't the only things. There are lots of things you can do. Um, uh, you know, and, and this doesn't just apply to elite athletes. This works for everybody. I mean, think about how many times, I know this happens to me a lot, it, I'm assuming it might happen to you too, you know, how many times you haven't been able to turn off work when you get home. You're thinking about the thing you were just working on, or that unit test that wasn't passing, or uh, how many weekends you spend kind of churning through a coding problem in your mind, it just keeps coming up and it won't go away, and uh, you know, you're out, doing something with some friends and you just keep thinking about that problem. You can't make it, and it just never gets out of your brain until you sit down and start working again. But if you don't give yourself time to recover, just like an athlete would, then you're leaving a lot of that productivity on the table because you're never in a you know, kind of full state of alertness anymore. You're always in the, uh, the focus mode or not even focus mode, just always in the mind churning mode. And if you can't uh, give your mind a little bit of time to rest and to recover, to think about something different, then, um, then you lose kind of some of your top level performance. Um, so say, take a cue from the elite athletes. That's what I've been trying to do. And uh, sh just completely shut it down. You know, the, whatever the problem is, it'll still be there on Monday. I promise. That's what I keep telling myself. Um, you know, really, the only time you don't need to shut it down is maybe if you're like being chased by a mountain lion or something. That's that's not a time. That's a time to stay in the heightened state 
uh, at least until it's over. It's going to be over one way or another. Uh, but you can step away from pretty much anything else. And, uh, and it's good to plan ahead for that and to have a time when it's time to step away and to do it and do it completely. And the completely part, like it's easy to set a timer and get up from get up and you know go get a cup of coffee or go on a walk or whatever. But um, you can't just do that. You have to shut the whole thing off. You can't just like walk around and because you're just gonna be thinking about the problem again. That's what I used to do, and it wasn't. It, it makes a big difference to totally shut it off. Um, and you can rely on those external cues and external helpers for that. Playing video games, watching shows, reading a book, um, whatever. Don't do anything that's too heightening, like, you know, reading the news. That might be a little too much. Um, but um, you can also train your mind to do it without any of those external cues. And that is uh, something else that I've spent a lot of time working on over the past couple years. And it's made the, probably the biggest impact on me out of everything I've done, even more than all the weight loss. Um, I, you know, deliberately training my mind through mindfulness and meditation just completely changed everything for me. Um, you know, it gave, it's what gave me the ability to stay present with whatever's going on in the moment. It's made me a nicer person, a happier person. I'm a better husband and a better father. And uh, it has made, you know, those times I want to shut things off, it's made them a lot easier as well. Um, but it was a, a, a rocky road getting there. You know, it, I tried meditating a couple times back in like 2017. It didn't stick. Um, but then, in that kind of the first half of the year, the second half of the year is kind of when the wheels started coming off. Um, in August, that was when my dad was first diagnosed with, uh, with lung cancer. And the next day, uh, this little storm called Hurricane Harvey hit. I live in Houston, and uh, it came by and said hi to us. And um, yeah, I, my home, my family's homes were, were spared, thankfully. We were pretty lucky, but uh, you know, it pretty much devastated everything around us. Uh, lots of friends and neighbors, you know, uh, losing everything. Seven, eight feet of water in their homes, that kind of stuff. So it was, um, it was a pretty difficult time, uh, you know, those things happening all at the same time. And, uh, <clears throat> and even, and I still know people who have not finished rebuilding. They're still recovering. It's uh, a very long process. Um, but anyway, in early 2018, I was you know, having trouble focusing on work and I just started a new job. And, uh, you know, I was looking for tools to help with my focus. You know, I, I, have, uh, I have ADD, so I have a lot of, I've been, that search has been ongoing for a long time for me. Um, and so I decided, well, I'll try the meditation thing because it can be good for that. So I started doing it every day. Um, and for the, the last year, actually, yeah, it's been a whole year now. Um, I've meditated at least 25 minutes a day, every day. Uh, I haven't missed a single day. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, I didn't really feel like it was doing much. Um, but over time, the changes, the very small changes accumulate. Again, I keep saying that, but that's how things, that's how this stuff works. Um, but uh, one thing I learned early on with, uh, with mindfulness meditation is I, I had some, a lot of misconceptions about what it was about. And, you know, I thought it was about clearing your mind and, uh, you know, calming down and relaxing and all that. But really, it's kind of, kind of the opposite of that. Um, you know, it, focusing is one of the practices, but it's not even really about that either. Um, that is the practice most people start out with, as did I. Um, but it's, uh, it's different. It's a lot more than that. Um, so I've struggled with ways to figure out how to explain this without sounding crazy. Um, but um, really, when you start, or when you're meditating, it really is, uh, like I said, it's not, you're not really clearing your mind. You're just letting things happen. 
and observing them. And you really get to see how weird your brain is, how weird your mind is, kind of how crazy you are. You know, you see thoughts just come out of nowhere. Like, where do they come from? I don't know where they come from. I still don't know. I do it every day. And I can't figure out who's actually thinking my thoughts. I know it's not, I don't think it's me. Um, but, you know, there's, the thoughts just show up. You know, you see there's just this, like, kind of asshole back in your head, just on and on, babbling on and on, just saying, hey, how you doing? Hey, what's for lunch? What does that smell? Did I take a shower? You know, like, what the fuck is a marmot? Like, this is... Your brain's just doing this stuff all the time. And uh, you know, it came, that went by really fast. You can't make it come back either. There, that guy. That's what a marmot is. I had to look it up. Because I was just thinking that as I was working on, the, on my presentation, I was like, what is a marmot? I don't know why. But seeing that and realizing that has a real value. You know, when that asshole back there starts offering up suggestions like, you know, you should eat that bag of chips or, Hey, that other asshole cut you off. You know, he hates you. Look at his smug face. You know, when, when you can see those thoughts arise and see, what, for, see them for what they are, then you can just let them dissolve away, which they always do. Um, and, uh, and so kind of the basic steps of mindfulness, mindfulness, med, mindfulness meditation is, you know, you sit, maybe close your eyes, maybe not. You start bringing uh, your focus, your full attention to the feeling of your breath, not thinking about it, just kind of feeling the sensations. And then there's a, a third step. Oops, I hit the button there. Um, there's a third step, which is kind of the secret sauce. It doesn't take long, and the asshole starts going. Um, and uh, he just starts spouting off. You probably, and if you're like me, or like most people, you probably feel like you've already failed, because now my mind isn't cleared. I'm just thinking about stuff. But um, that's actually a victory because you noticed it this time. Turns out that's actually happening all the time and you're just lost in thought and, have no, and, didn't, and don't know that it's going on. Um, you're just reacting to what the asshole in the back of your head is saying. So once you notice you've become distracted, and this is the big trick, is you just start again. And return your attention to the breath and just do it all over again. Over and over and over and over and over. Um, you know, in a, I can't, I don't know how many times I do it in, a, 30 minute meditation, even in five minutes, it's, you know, 50 times maybe, I don't know. Um, but uh, it's a, an author named Dan Harris, wrote a book called 10% Happier. He calls it uh, doing bicep curls for your brain. You really are kind of training yourself to pay attention to what's going on inside. And uh, he came back, go away. Um, so what I learned when I started watching my mind and training myself most important thing I learned is first to just give myself a break. Meditating is hard, and in the beginning, I was really critical of myself. You know, my mind would stop, start wandering, and I'd get frustrated. I'm like, I'm such a bad meditator. I'm such an idiot. Stop doing this. Um, which, of course, is just more thinking, right? Like, that's the same guy, the same asshole. It's like meta-asshole. Um, so it's, you know, it's really easy to let that frustration take you over and own you, right? Um, you know, I like to be good at things, like most of you do, I assume. But, uh, you know, criticizing myself was counterproductive. So I had to learn to be gentle with myself, to have compassion for myself. And the moment where, that moment where I was already, already where I was lost in thought, you know, has already passed. And now that I've noticed it, I can just gently return to what I was doing, and we're back to normal. And then it happens again. And then it goes over and over again. But over months of daily practice, what happened is I stopped taking myself so seriously. Started giving myself a break. And not like a surface, surface kind of lip service, give myself a break. Like, uh, you know, you just need to take a break. It was uh, in a more deep and compassionate way. Uh, I, basically, I started to understand that I'm a human like everyone else, and I do human -y things just like everyone else, and it's kind of part of the deal. And that was a major breakthrough for me. And um, it turns out that once you have real compassion for yourself and accept your humanity, it's much easier to do the same with others. Um, and, uh, oops, did it again. It's very sensitive to touching. Um, so, uh, right. Um, 
it's, much, much, so it's much easier to do that kind of stuff with others. And my med meditation practice started extending off of the cushion and into the rest of my life. This had a uh, profound effect on my relationships at home and at work. And I stopped getting angry at people or frustrated with people as often as I used to. Still do it, but it doesn't happen as often. And, um, and I can see those thoughts arise. And, uh, even, and even if I don't see the thoughts arise, I can actually feel the emotions starting in my body. And then I can choose to respond or not, and instead of just reacting like I used to. Um, it's really a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing to realize you have control over that. That when you, it's, it's almost impossible once you're really paying attention. There, I, I can't imagine how you could be angry for more than, uh, you know, 10 seconds or, you know, m more, a minute at most. Definitely not 10 minutes, an hour, a day. It's, it's impossible if you're paying attention. Um, so I, you know, I can see and honor and use my thoughts and feelings rather than kind of being driven around by them. So to kind of bring it back to the beginning, it's, you know, how, how did all that help me in that awful moment? Um, well, there was one other thing that I kind of began to understand as I practiced the mindfulness and meditation, and it's, it's uh, how much we suffer is directly related to how much we're lost in thought. It's kind of all about the frame of mind. It's, the whole thing. Um, and uh, this is a difficult concept to explain, but uh, um, I've sat a lot with it, and you know, it's about, it's, there's a word for it in psychology called framing. And uh, it's really about how you frame what's going on and how you frame your thoughts. Uh, there's an author, a neuroscientist named Sam Harris, he kind of illustrates this point a lot with physical pain. He, uh, he said, you know, imagine, that you're in the gym doing a really heavy workout and you know it's it's painful right you're doing squats and your legs are just burning and uh, you're really feeling it but it's like that good pain now imagine three in the morning you woke up and felt that exact same pain in your legs would you think that was a good pain and you were really proud of it or would you freak out and call an ambulance it's the exact same pain but with a completely different frame and uh, Spending a lot of time paying attention to my thoughts has really helped me to reframe things. And that, uh, that's how I was able to not suffer so much when, uh, I was, when I was feeling all that pain and all that sadness and the grief. It was there and I felt it, I felt it probably more strongly than I would have before, but um, I knew what it was and which I wouldn't have before. And so it was, uh, um, I'm glad I prepared myself even though I didn't know I was preparing myself. Uh, so that's really all I have. Um, got some Q&A. Uh, you know, you guys can just, we can just sit here in silence if you want. I'm fine with that. Uh, but we have two minutes. And I also be around all week or down here. Feel free to talk to me anytime. Um, since, uh, you know, I don't get angry as much anymore, I probably won't yell at you or anything. So, is that, thanks. So I got almost two minutes, does anyone have questions? Yes, uh, Levi first. Sure. Yeah, that's great to Thanks. So, I wanted to know, meditation has been a challenge for me as well, so I'm curious if you have any advice on Right. Um, yeah, there's a lot I left out because I only have 45 minutes. Um, there's a few things. First of all, there's no such thing as being good at it, right? Um, you know, it's, uh, there are lots of things I did. I, I've done a lot of guided meditations. I've tried a bunch of different apps and other ways of doing it. Uh, but what really helps um, is another person, like a teacher or a group even. Um, you know, I found a local uh, Zen group uh, um, that just sits and meditates a couple days a week. And uh, I'll go there and there's, you know, a, there's someone in the group who is a teacher um, who also has a master who comes by every once in a while. And, uh, and I can sit with them and ask questions. And then we also just sit together and meditate. And so, you know, it's not like a 
religious kind of thing or anything like that. It's just everyone sits and meditates. And uh, so a teacher or someone or just a group of other people that you can talk about it with really helps. Um, other than that, it's um, you know trying guided meditations like in apps or you know downloaded audio or anything like that uh, can also make a difference. Sometimes you just need that, uh, no matter how experienced you are, that extra reminder that you're meditating. You might get lost in thought, especially if you haven't had enough sleep. Um, and that, that's, that, doing all those things helped me. And that, I, I went on a retreat. That helped me a lot, too. It was, like, it was only a four-day retreat, but it was, uh, it was interesting. I cut that out of the talk. We'll do that another time. Right. Tom, you got something? Thanks. Uh, what was your wife's reaction during this journey? Did she join you? Did she step aside? Did she encourage you? Uh, she, when I first started trying it out, we both tried it at the same time, and it didn't really stick with either of us. And she kind of lost interest, and um, so she doesn't. She doesn't do it. She is, uh, you know, doesn't mind that I do it because I'm a nicer person. Um, she. Uh, no, I mean, she's fine with it. She supports me, but no, we don't do it together. She doesn't really do it. We, you know, we occasionally talk about some of the topics and some of the things that I've learned or come up with or I'm, or I'm working through. You know, like I said, it's a very active process, so I'm still working through things. I'm, you know, not, it's kind of a weird state of thinking, so I don't know. Um, so yeah, she's, unlike the diet which we did together, the meditation thing she's not really doing, um, but she is, you know, at least able to get some of the benefits. So, anyone else? Oh, yes. Um, I do it the same at the same uh, one or two times every day, uh, depending on when I get up in the morning. Uh, I'll. I'll either do it for like half an hour or an hour in the day. Uh, if I'm up early enough in the morning, I'll do it before I do the yoga. Um, kind of gives me a little extra time for my body to wake up so the yoga's not quite as painful. Um, and uh, I usually will do some in the evening as well. But also, you don't just have to sit. That's the other thing that, you know, you kind of do it anywhere. You could do it, you could have done it while you were sitting in here and no one would have noticed. Um, that's, that's the nice thing about it is it's one of those things you can do and no and without really anyone judging you, right? Uh, walking meditation is a thing. I do that a lot. Like sometimes when I'm at the office, I'll take five or ten minutes and I'll go do a walking meditation. Um, and that, uh, you know, that's a good way to, like I said, kind of do that little shutting it off for a while thing. Um, you know, it's a little different. I do, you can do it, do it at different speeds, different paces. There's all different kinds of ways you can do walking meditation. You can do it very slowly and feel your body, or you can do it a little more quickly and kind of, you know, watch things happen in your field of vision. And, you know, kind of uh, something I like to do when I'm doing like a walking meditation, especially when I'm doing it more quickly, is, you know, I'll start flipping my perspective as I'm walking up, like uh, walking down a sidewalk with trees. You know, at first I'm looking at it as, as I'm moving towards the trees, and then I flip my perspective and, and, and think of the trees coming towards me, and you know, stuff like that, and just kind of to keep my focus going. So you can do a lot of different things. Um, a lot of these are things I found out by just reading, reading or finding them in apps. Uh, you know, the 10% Happier app is, uh, that uh, Dan Harris says is pretty good. Sam Harris's app, Waking Up, is pretty good. Um, I started with the Headspace app, which was pretty good. Uh, you don't need any of that. I mean, I'd say probably two thirds of my meditation are just me sitting on a cushion or, or walking, and then another one third I'll, you know, for a little change up, I'll do a guided meditation. Um, so it's different for everyone, and everyone practices differently. So, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. What's your typical meal about? That's okay. Well, if you, if you would like to get up, you can get up and uh, is the new speaker in here? I can, I can tear this down and just keep going.